Sorry for being just a couple of minutes late. Uh, Lee Hamilton was receiving us upstairs and, and welcoming uh, this distinguished delegation from Somaliland this morning, this morning, this afternoon now. Uh, let me welcome all of you to uh, this uh, session. Uh, we have structured this on an invitation-only basis, knowing if people would have a particular interest in the subject and to allow a very open, candid exchange. Um, Somaliland is really uh, occupies a very unique position in, uh, in Africa at this point in time as uh, not yet achieving full diplomatic recognition, but having a, a rather uh, remarkable success as in building a constitutional democracy within the country. Um, and in beginning now to establish increasingly a more open set of relationships, if not formal, formally constituted, constituting recognition, nonetheless, um, from the African Union to the European Union to the United States and others, there are increasingly high-level contacts that are taking place. And so we are very, but it's also fair to say, as the President was observing to Lee Hamilton a moment ago, Somaliland is not a subject that is well known to uh, most Americans. Um, there isn't that much attention, much vis that much visibility. Uh, the President's um, visit to the Washington at this point comes against the backdrop of the continuing concern about the violence and instability within S Somal Somalia itself and, w and with the potential implications that they are people in Somaliland are concerned about in terms of the, of the reverberations of that conflict upon the evolution of, of Somaliland. So I'm not going, um, let me just by way of um, offering a, of a, I can't find my notes, a brief introduction of our, of our guest, which I don't have my real, in the moment I ask you to introduce yourself, I wanted to say something about your background. Um, the president has been involved in a variety of roles over the years in different government capacities, both on the development side and the intelligence side. Uh, was the, the vice president of Somalia at the time? Somaliland. Uh, Somaliland, rather. Mm. Uh, at the time of the death of the president. Mm. And so it moved into the presidency initially on an interim basis, and then eight months later was elected in his own right. Uh, as he will describe, the country is governed by a system very similar to that of the United States, with a two-house uh, parliament consisting of both uh, an assembly and the, and the House of Elders, both bodies, 82 and 86 in number. Um, and um, the president uh, is a distinguished scholar by Excuse me. Let me just let me just pause there, and let's just move on to the discussion. <laughs> and if there's some key elements of your background that I have left out, please feel free to <laughs> to, uh, to offer them up, Mr. Sure. President. So, uh, well, we do. We'd like to proceed by having a initial opening of 15, 20 minutes of discussion. Yeah. And then um, we'll take field questions. From we, the we can open, and I would like to give my Minister of Foreign Affairs, Abdullahi, and my. Being here, but I can say my background. I've been previously. I've been working in different places. Sometimes diplomat, sometimes intelligence officer, immigration officer, different places. Governor, businessman, businessman. Then I became a vice president way back '97, and our late president passed away. 202 in hospital Pretoria. I was in, in the country at that time and I called the parliament and the ministers and I said, where will we go? Then they said, through the constitution, you are the president. After 10 minutes, I become an interim president. Safely, nothing happened, no problem take away. Which, is, which cannot happen in many African countries. Uh, I, I was having eight months to do the ele election preparation that was planned to happen in the country. 
people who have never made any elections for almost 38 years to go for election. It was not an easy job. People were afraid about going to that election. And they proposed that I will stay back for another three years interim period so that the election be postponed. But I refused that offer. I said we will go to the elections. And we tell our people that the election is more important than having number of years without election. Fortunately, we have made our first elections 15 December, uh, 202 local government elections. <coughs> then by April 16, we made presidential elections. Uh, the matching between me and my uh, my the opposition, the one we were running together was 18 votes only. Eighty votes only. Eighty votes only. He asked for, for recounting. And when he asked for recounting, I gained more number, and my number increased to 217. <coughs> it finished up with that uh, to, the, to the court. And there is there were no problems that is happening in many African countries. We, we, we ran then for the election of the parliament. At that time, we were going from a clan-based parliament to a multi-party system. It was very difficult. And all our clans were trying to remain in their seats because everybody was afraid that they would lose their... Our parliament rejected that we go for elections at that time. Uh, I, I take a ruling to the High Court. I said, what you have proposed is not right. And the court supported me, and we, we went for the election. I was having the majority of the parliament at that time, but I was doing my mission to do the elections, democratic <coughs> process, to be impractical in my, in my country. Uh, the parliament was elected. 2005 November, uh, the two opposition party gained more in the parliament. They joined together, and before coming to the uh, to the parliament, they have chosen the first chairman, the second chairman, and the, the chairman, the first chairman, and second chairman. It was a problem, but I accepted that. In, to save the country that we go on chaos and anarchy, and it's this country that is functioning democratically in the whole of Africa, which is called Somaliland, many people that didn't differentiate between Somalia and Somaliland. The only country who is in the agenda is Somalia, which is in trouble and which is supported by the international community. So Maryland's always become a victim for the bad deeds of our of their brothers of southern Somalia. No piracy has happened in our seas. No human trafficking has happened in our place. We have built a nation from the scratch after the catastrophe, 1991. Our late <coughs> president demobilized 50,000 militia. He restructured the state rule, rule in place. Uh, government in place, rule of law in place, functioning state, collecting their revenue, doing all what any government has done in, practically in their own country, yet in search of recognition, the right to be a member of the international community. Unfortunately, the other part who failed to function is part of the international community. And that's why we are coming here and elsewhere to appeal that we get our rights to be a member of the international community. We have made a contact with the African Union and we <coughs> confessed the Commission of the African Union to send a fact-finding mission to our country in 2005. And they made a declaration, Somaliland be recognized, it will not be 
will not open Bondora Bogus to Africa. They will go just to the boundaries that we have gained during our independence. <clears throat> and we have gained independence prior to the other part of Somalia, five days ahead. At that time, the reason that we united was to, gain, to bring five Somalis together, including Djibouti, which is now a republic, the fifth region of Ethiopia, North Frontier District of Kenya, <coughs> And that idea doesn't work. We went with wars, with Ethiopia, adventures, and a lot of problems. And when the country was collapsed in way back 1991, we started to withdraw from that union. So in short, this is a brief history of Somaliland. And we are seeking our recognition. I didn't see anywhere that we are lacking any legal means to be a country, but it's only a political. What we are facing is a political problem that is against our recognition. I will leave the <coughs> remaining for my question. Great. Thank you very much. Well, I, have, I have many questions. And there are people around the table that have been very well versed in the horn, generally, over many years, Ambassador David Shin, um, Ambassador um, Mark Bellamy, um, uh, Dick McCall, who has worked in the region, uh, Principal African Advisor for USAID, who you may, may know previously, and others around this table. So let's open it up and, yep. and take whatever questions. David? You know, uh, if I could sort of move us into the future a bit. You have elections coming up in August of this year, I believe. Um, one, I assume you are running for president again in August. Is, if you could clarify that, I would appreciate it. Yes. But more importantly, uh, could you comment on, on sort of how you see the, the process for the run-up to these elections? How is it going? Are, are, you, uh, are you satisfied that these are going to be good elections and that there are a lot of efforts underway to ensure the election goes well uh, and that perhaps some of the, of the issues that came up in 2003 could be avoided? Yeah, because now we have introduced voter registration. We didn't use for the first three elections. Now we introduce voter registration so that no fraud can happen in our election, in upcoming elections. So we, we are planning, and the EU are in support of that, and we have requested the, your administration also to support that issue while we were here. So we hope the forthcoming elections will be better transparent than it was before. Can I just add? Yeah. The other thing, Interpeace is heavily involved, particularly with the Electoral Commission, and the feedback I get is that it's going very well in strengthening the capacity to run these elections. So, just one uh, yeah. um, Actually, you know, the purpose, as uh, Dr. Wolby said here, that we would like to have here today is just to uh, have a free float in discussion about what's happening in the region, not only in Somaliland and Somalia, and also to look into issues that uh, have a clear impact on the development and peace and prosperity in the region. What is the situation in Somalia, where to go, what is the way out, where is that going to lead the people of Somalia, that's the former Italian colony of Somalia, where is that, where, what's their fate, what kind of impact, what's going on right now in that place would have on the regional stability. It's a very, very, very uh, turbulent region and the situation there what kind of impact that would have on Somaliland's stability? I mean, what is the policy that, that the United States of America should have or one could recommend? Are we going to continue with the current paradigm and model that would say, let us just wait and wait and wait and see what happens in Baidawa or Mogadishu? Or somebody will just say, well, there is an end to that because that will have negative impact on the region and therefore we have to swallow a new pill. What's that pill? Is it the recognizing Somaliland and using it, you know, as a 
you know, springing board to bring about peace in for that humanitarian colony of Somalia. This is the kind of uh, of, a, of a free floating discussion, really, we wanted to have here today. So please participate and see what you can say. <laughs> uh, well, maybe a little bit along those lines. Um, Somalia is not a sovereign state. Part of the purpose of your visit is to change that. Um, um, or is not recognized as a sovereign state. Part of the your 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 uh, purpose of your visit is to change that. Uh, but it, de facto, Somaliland has to function uh, as uh, with the attributes of sovereignty, and that includes managing your relations with with your neighbors. And I wonder if you would comment a little bit on your relationship with some of your principal neighbors. Uh, I'm thinking of, of uh, Somaliland's relations with Ethiopia. Uh, and talk a little bit too, if you could, about Somalia, uh, Somaliland's uh, relations with Puntland, your neighbor to the east. Uh, I would like to, uh, first of all, uh, we welcome uh, it, this opportunity and we highly appreciate uh, what you have done. Uh, the experts in, the, in, the, in this city are, are here on the, on, the, on, the, on the Horn of Africa. In fact, uh, uh, so uh, uh, specifically when I, when I, when I, when I uh, uh, answer this uh, question, uh, our relationship with Ethiopia. We, Somaliland has played a significant role in the regional geopolitical stability. Uh, we have a very good friendship with uh, Ethiopia, uh, both in trade, uh, commerce, uh, 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 security issues, cross-border issues. Uh, so we have got a very, very good relationship with Ethiopia. Uh, it's been progressing. Uh, it's very strategic both in security and in, 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 in development. Uh, having said that, uh, with regards to the uh, Puntland, uh, Puntland uh, uh, has, was created uh, uh, on the basis of a clan, uh, on the basis of ethnicity. Uh, uh, we consider that a very, very serious uh, problem to not only to, to the region, but to, to Africa in large. Uh, because uh, you have clans all over the places. Uh, for example, uh, what used to be called Machertania, uh, where the Italian Somalia, before the, Brit uh, the Italian Som Somalia, southern Somalia, uh, that's where Puntland is. Uh, so it's one clan and nothing but one clan. Uh, there are clans from that area that live also in Somaliland. <coughs> uh, within the former British protectorate boundaries. Uh, in addition to that, there are also uh, clans who, the same clan, some of them, who also live in this Ethiopia, the uh, Region 5, and as well as Northern Frontier District, and the other part of Somalia, uh, Southern Mogadishu. So if one uses that as a statehood, you know, it, it is, I think, a very, very bad precedent for, for Africa. Uh, imagine having Tutsis in, in, in Rwanda, claiming also the Tutsis living in Congo or, or, or in Burundi. Uh, so it's a, it's a bad precedent. Our relationship with that has been more or less, uh, we, they have been a thorn on the side, to, to be far, very frank with you. Somaliland uh, tried to solve the issue within Somaliland in a very, very peaceful manner. Uh, we have been provoked uh, multiple times. Uh, we have been attacked multiple times, but today uh, there is no major uh, conflict uh, as such. Uh, we are now in place, uh, we have put in place uh, the administration in Las Anod, uh, which is very, very inclusive. Regional capital. With the regional capital, which is the, uh, with the assistance uh, and the acceptance of the, of the, of the, of the local people. Uh, now we have established it for the first time an inclusive uh, transparent, effective administration in Las Anod, uh, and it's functioning. Uh, so we will hope uh, that uh, there will be no other provocations from, from, from that part, uh, particularly from Garoway. Uh, this is what we have been doing, uh, in fact, and uh, we are now structuring, we are now building the uh, administration, the infrastructure, uh, the schools, uh, the uh, hospitals we are working, uh, the government of Somaliland put uh, two percent uh, 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 tax surcharge 
for the development of, of, of Lazanot. There is a commission that the president has commissioned, uh, which is uh, also uh, raising funds for the development of, of the area. Civil society organizations are involved. Uh, we have mobilized the international community, international organizations who are residing in Somaliland to visit and look into the needs of the, of the, of the situation. And we will hope that uh, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of Puntland, between Puntland and Somaliland, will be solved uh, amicably. Uh, we have no claim uh, the territory, ter territory of Somalia, the, what used to be called Southern Somalia. Uh, we will spread our administration peacefully, uh, effectively, uh, inclusively, with the assistance of the, of the, of the people. And uh, this is the understanding that is now prevailing. I can say in few words, it's the extension of the problem of southern Somalia, this Putland. It's nothing more than that. The, their projection of problem towards Somalia is part of that. Because the man who created Putland is Abdullah Yusuf, and it's now the uh, interim president. And it's a clan based administration which has no history. The history between the Somali Republic was Somaliland and Somalia. There is no other history. All others is a creation in between that. Uh, the downfall the, after the catastrophe has happened, the, you, you hear the central uh, regions, you hear Pai and Bakol, uh, many names came out of it. But the historical uh, background between these two countries is Somaliland and Somalia. We, others are projections that have come out after the catastrophe happened by 1991. And now, as the minister said, we have extended our administration way back as Anod. We'll be going to our borders peacefully. We are not ready to provoke, to provoke in that area, in, in Garaway or Bosaso. We are just going to our borders peacefully. We would like to have uh, good relations with our neighbors, whether they are Somalia or Ethiopia or Djibouti, because we cannot choose our neighbors, but we can choose how we will live with our neighbors. We are trying from our side that we will always try to live peacefully with our neighbors. Uh, and I hope we will overcome this. We have been tolerant for many years. Does not the issue of Puntland get caught up in the broader question of whether or not the international community chooses to recognize Somaliland? Because isn't this part and parcel of the, of the broader concern that to recognize Somaliland might lead to further demands for other kinds of repartitioning or fragmentation of other states where you have these ethnic uh, overlays? Um, now, you've made a case that historically you had independence you were part of a, you existed prior to the union. Yes, indeed. Between the British and Italian. Mm -hmm. Five days ahead. Uh, five days ahead. Um, but is that, I mean, I, I assume that that is the principle remaining as the International Committee looks at it, the African Union in particular, I'm thinking, that's got to be still their preoccupation, is it not? But I notice also that the African Union now seems to be making a bit more of an overture and talking about some broader form of acknowledgement of Somaliland. Can you describe what's happening in, in, in that evolution and how you deal with this broader question that to recognize Somaliland will, according to some, make more difficult the resolution of the Somali conflict and will lead to other problems? Let him take the first hit first. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, you know, uh, there are contradictory uh, views uh, in, 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 in this. Uh, there is a resolution that was passed at the OAU in 1963. And that was to stop, uh, uh, at the time, Somali irreditism and Somali expansionism. Uh, because there was a claim the union between Somaliland and the, what used to be called Southern Somalia uh, was with the understanding of bringing all Somali-speaking people in Horn of Africa under one flag. That's why we have had, in those days, the five-star uh, blue flag. Uh, that included Djibouti, 
which was the former French Somaliland, uh, the Northern Frontier District of Kenya, and also the uh, Ogaden, so-called, now Region 5. In the constitution at the time of Somalia, the Republic, what used to be called Republic of Somalia, there was an article which said all Somali-speaking people in the Horn of Africa ought to be brought under one flag, by all means, including force. And force, we did it. Two major wars with Ethiopia, uh, low intensity wars with Kenya, with the shifters, uh, in order to stop that Somali nationalism. OAU passed a resolution that colonial boundaries ought to be respected in Africa in order to stop territorial ambitions of others. Now that we went back to our own colonial boundaries and we said to the African Union, hey, we went back according to the resolution of the OAU and the subsequent executive uh, of the African Union. So it's paradoxical, really. Uh, you know, where, you know, the Africans will, will, will stand. Uh, the case of Somaliland is legitimate, it's legal. Uh, as the President has stated, the Anglo-Italian treaties, the Anglo-French treaties, the Anglo-Ethiopian treaties are in place. And it will not become a precedent with regards to, uh, with regards to others. For example, you have Southern Somalia, which was always one entity from Bosaso, from Cape Cardiffi to uh, Kismayo. To Kismayo. Mm -hmm. that, that, was, that was always the case. So this will not be a precedent as far as we are concerned, and that's what the African Union has stated, the Commission particularly, the Commission of the African Union clearly stated in their report 2005 that mm -hmm. the case of Somaliland is very unique, and therefore it ought to be discuss it and uh, uh, fin finalize it. The status of Somaliland ought to be finalized. So we, we, we consider that there will not be uh, someone in Bayambok Hall cannot say that, uh, you know, we are, we are uh, an entity. And incidentally, the uh, Puntland says always they are waiting for a federal Somalia, you know. Uh, Even in their charter. In, yeah. in, in their charter. Uh, so. Uh, as far as we are concerned, we do have a case, we have a legitimate case, we have a moral case. Uh, we have built a nation, uh, we are a constitutional state. The voice of the people have been, the will of the people, ha we, we are, we, 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 the, the, the referendum that we have taken for our constitution, finish it once <coughs> and for all the status of Somalilanders and the faith of the Somalilanders. Uh, there was a question that was asked uh, when we were uh, up uh, there uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the chairman. And that was, what is that Somaliland, what's the problem Somaliland is facing? Somaliland is facing, Somaliland is simply between a hard rock and a hard place. It cannot access to international financial institutions. It cannot access uh, bilateral uh, relations with the internet. It cannot. It cannot. It cannot uh, trade. You know. Uh, it cannot uh, access to international financial institutions bilateral relations. Although we are a, a de facto state, so our contribution is missing from the international community, really, and that is one of the biggest problems. You have here a democratic state. Uh, a nation that has a uh, rule uh, of law, uh, that has held elections, that has exercised uh, good governance, uh, human rights. Uh, we have got over 93 human rights organizations only in Hargeisa, not even in Bro or Erigavo or elsewhere. Only in Hargeisa you have at least, from, from, from uh, what we know, 93 different organizations. So uh, it's about time that the international community really takes a hard look on the case of Somalia. Yes. Could you identify yourself, please? Yes, I absolutely will. Hello, Mr. President. My name is Lynn Fredrickson. I'm here in my capacity as an independent researcher, but I'm also known in Somaliland for just having gone on an Amnesty International mission. <laughs> but I'm here today as an independent researcher. I have recently been to your country a few times. I was in La Sanad in December. 
and conducted some research there, which was very enlightening because there was a range of opinion in support of Somaliland or Puntland or a number of other positions that I found when I was conducting my research. One of the interesting things that I found in talking to the mayor and others was that it sounds like there's going to be a Dolbahante, intra-Dolbahante conference within the region to try to solve differences within the clan. And I also heard many people tell me that they were very pleased that the government of Somaliland stayed outside of the city in conducting military operations in the fall. But I'm also aware that there was recently some fighting just over the weekend, a little further south from La Sanad. Uh, in that this particular region is critical to recognition of Somaliland. It speaks to your monopoly on power of your territory of Somaliland. I'd like to ask you if you could speak for a few minutes about the possible conference among the Dobahante and the fact that most people in the region seem to be swayable in support of Somaliland as long as development is sustained education, clinics, infrastructure, and, and what your plans are besides, I know about the 2% and the commission, but what your plans are in order to ensure that this particular situation is resolved. Yes, we, we are doing both reconciliation between the people and doing the, addressing the needs of the people in that area. That's our plan. Uh, you know, in Somaliland, there are ma Somaliland are uh, multi-ethnic, and it, there are many people who believe in nationalism still in Borama, in Hargeisa, in Borao. You can find there, uh, you can find in Las Anod. It's not uh, strange. Some people <coughs> who are uh, advocating that nationalism is better than separation. But what we are taking is the majority of the people who they are supporting, and. We are trying to, to reconcile and to make a consensus with the people and to do what we can do for this country. You know, you have visited Las Anod. There's no drinking water in Las Anod. What we are planning as a government, we want to make, uh, to do it, a drinking water in Las Anod by our government, which has never been done before. So we have to not to go there and to stay there, but to do something better than the people who were staying there several months before. So in the problems that are in Somalia, whether in Las Anat or elsewhere, is a minor problem. The international community, they are dealing with Somalia where there is no system of government and they are giving support. They are trying to, to make it a real government. And we have been penalized, so we landers, for nothing else, but because that part is not coming out of the kiosk for 17 years. We sometimes ask how long the international community will take to make a wise decision and give the credit that Somaliland have achieved in so many years. What was the 2% reference that you made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Durbhante, we, we, we accept every conference that we will do there. <laughs> we, we have been today, even before I come here, I've been with that clan you were talking about, Las Anod people. They visited me in the hotel and we were together. We are of the same people and we know each other. We are, we are doing our business in, in many ways. We are coming together. They will be coming there. We'll be trying how to solve if there are any, anything remains in the minds of the people, how we, how, how we, come together and solve any problems that is prefer any differences between the people. Because if there is a difference, you know, while we were building Somaliland, way back 94, 95, there were wars between inside Hargeisa, inside Borough. So it's a process. Somaliland is a process. 
that we have managed to pass and to make it by ourselves. Not like other pra uh, our previous brothers. We are not waiting a ready-made government from the international community. <laughs> we are doing it by ourselves. Let me, if I can, if I can just add to what Lynn said. Lynn, uh, regarding the conference you are talking about, the Lubanta conference, there was a previous uh, conference, a Lubanta conference in Bo'ani, as an area that's not far away from Las Anod, which is the regional capital of the uh, governorate of Seoul. Uh, there was no agreement in that because uh, somehow the ideas were divided. Uh, most of the people who attended that conference were sent from Puntland and they were actually pushing the, the, the view of Puntland. Others said we don't need to push anybody's point. Let us have our own conference, deal with the issues, and come up with practical resolution. Somehow, somewhere, it did not get anywhere. So they decided to have another one. That one, they tried to have it inside Somaliland in a place Somali called. Chichini. Yeah. Even in Las Anod. Yeah. We accept even in Las Anod. Yeah. background. Mm -hmm. That one also was, uh, you know, supposed to be held in a town called Buhod Lake. Somehow it did not work. The government of Somaliland actually is encouraging that they would just should sit down together and talk to each other and to thrash out the problems that are there among themselves. They are divided, but I do believe, as you said, a lot of them could be, could be swayed through development. Development has begun. The international organizations are going there. Water is being uh, refined. Uh, everything that can be done will be done. There was no government in Las Anod. Buntland did not leave a government behind. No primary school system no that was functioning. No offices for the government, and even no primary health care you know, clinics that were functioning. So all those things are under construction or at least planned for. So that development is taking place, albeit, you know, uh, smaller than we would like it to have because simply of the lack of resources. Uh, but uh, from the side of Somaliland, there's no coercion whatsoever. What they are doing, the boundaries are known. Somaliland will not back off and they will not go back from its international boundaries. But Somaliland is ready to deal with those groups, just like the Lulbahantes, to do everything under the sun, you know, to address their needs. Yeah. The minister Lynn, want to uh, respond to the 2% yeah. of Lynn, it, I won't. Yeah. Lynn, uh, you, you were there. Yes, uh, I'm there. Yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm there. Okay. I'm sorry, okay, I, I'm just percent? curious about the 2% reference, but yeah. we can come back. 2% is uh, the money that we but allocated to upgrade uh, the infrastructure of Las Anod and that surrounding area. Oh, okay. Thank uh, you. Please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Sean Jessen Peterson. Uh, I'm listed here as the uh, United States Institute of Peace. It is true. I am a guest scholar at the U.S. Institute, but I'm also since the 1st of January the uh, U.S. Washington-based representative of independent diplomat, and uh, our organization uh, have a very, very close relationship with independent diplomats. So I'm delighted to see you here, Mr. President, uh, with your delegation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, if we could come back to the issue of African Union uh, and political developments. I understand that you have been very active. I understand that through your activities you have won what I would call new friends uh, who have raised the issue of Somaliland uh, at recent uh, AU summits. Uh, I would be very interested if you could say just a little bit, you have mentioned the OAU, uh, the African Union Commission, but maybe a few words about developments uh, at the uh, political level of the African Union. And the other question, which is a little bit different, but still you have talked about being penalized for the situation in the region despite all your progress on democracy, rule of law, etc. Uh, and I would ask, uh, have you had a chance to uh, discuss with the authorities here the travel advisory uh, which is in place uh, recommending against uh, travel uh, to a place that uh, seems to be uh, very peaceful and uh, well managed? Yeah, thank you very much. You know, in Africa, it's a long way to go. We, we have been with your <coughs> two days before and we have been talking about this issue. Uh, to make a consensus about 
it takes us to get 28 member states to accept Somaliland to be a member of the African Union. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a mission almost impossible to bring 28 member states to Africa <laughs> to, to make a consensus and agree that Somaliland is independent. And we are, we are trying our best, whatever it takes, will be pushing our case with the African Union member states. And we will be uh, making some, asking you, your government and the British government to make, to support us in our, our struggle to come out of this uh, uh, dilemma that we are in, lack of recognition, how they can support us in the future. We're talking about that. We have spoken about that last question. Traveling uh, and Somalia. We have recommended that we are more safer than Nairobi, more safer <laughs> than many <laughs> than many African countries. If you visit Somalia now and go to Hargeisa, you can see money transfer in the street. There is no police, no robbery, no gangs. And they are marketing the gold in the street. It's, it's anybody, any foreign who comes to our country will become this strange people who are doing this business, money transfer in the streets. No robbery, no gangs, no police are guiding this. You cannot imagine how, how the people are there in place. So we recommended your, your government. Whom we met with that they, we recommended this ban should be taken away from Somaliland and let the, your government and any, any intellectual from your uh, government is uh, this ban will also have an impact to travel to Somaliland. Maybe the scholars can come like. Uh, uh, David Sheen, David Sheen, he, he was came, there before. Yeah, yeah, he came to me. I remember <laughs> before our election, he visited me at home. And, <coughs> and we are very proud of him that he is one of our advocates in here. And a critic, too. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a critic we accept. But you talk for us uh, many times. And is there a government, is there a government being responsive to the in, travel ban issue at all? Or? In, 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 yeah. We, 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 we have requested, we, we, we requested that this ban should be taken. In, in fact, the British responded just in our meeting before we came here that they will review the policy, which was really a very good, good position. So we're waiting uh, at least in a positive uh, 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 mood. And we have also officially requested from yeah. the State Department to, to review, and uh, we, will, we will hope that they will look uh, into it. But uh, with the African Union, yes, we have made incremental uh, gains. gains. Uh, for the first time, the, discussing the issue of Somaliland at the executive level or at the peace and security level uh, about its status, it's no longer a taboo. So we consider that a very big step forward. Uh, we consider we classified the African states, African, uh, African member states, in three groups. Those who are on board with the issue of Somaliland, very positive, like Rwanda, Ghana, Zambia, Kenya, Ethiopia, among others. And those who are still standing on the sidelines, they don't know yet what to do. And there are those who are naysayers, and these are very few, insignificant, but very powerful mostly from Arab North uh, Africa. So our strategy at this stage is to soften the position of our Northern Arab brothers and also convince those who are still standing on the sidelines. Uh, quite, of the, quite a number of them, we are working already on them. Uh, but on top of that, I think it's also very crucial to also engage, it's not only uh, for the Africans, but UN member states. And this is where we are also uh, trying to push both at the 
uh, European Union member states, and also uh, the United States uh, and, 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 and Norway as well. So we are quite uh, pushing as, as fast as we possibly can, and uh, uh, we have laid our case to, to, to the State Department and to the uh, other agencies. Uh, if, 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 I, I, okay, if I had just one single, you know, quickly, you know, that the, 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 the ban that we were talking about is not only really hurting us on the diplomatic side, it's just a slap of, on us because it really impacts negatively on our private sector and economic development. When you don't have business people who are willing to come to Somaliland to come and to deal with our business people, then you cannot do business with the international community because to begin with, these people cannot come because of the ban. So that is, again, really is hurting us from that side, and that's what we told the United States government and emphasized that, look, if we are talking about economic development and private sector development, that's, again, another negative uh, that side that the, uh, the ban has, and that should be taken into consideration. I think if Somalia becomes a member of the international, our voice is not heard in anywhere. We have been stationed too remote from all our, in the Horn of Africa. We never come to the centers that we, <coughs> we talk about, uh, that we are part and parcel of the Horn of Africa. We are a functioning state in place, but we are not in any, we didn't come we cannot come to any forum in the African Union, whether in the IGAT or the African Union. So even we cannot contribute what we would have to contribute in, in that issue. We are playing a significant role in our area because we made that country peacefully, no trafficking of terrorists. We have captured. We are the only people who have captured terrorists in our country and who sent them to open uh, to the court openly and tested them. And they were sentenced, tried, tried and they were sentenced to different sentences. Uh, sentences. Uh, and we, we, we proved that they were guilty in front. We, they were having their lawyers brought them in front of the court openly. So we are doing uh, at our best in our area, but we are out of the equation. Of the equation, we cannot come to the forums that we can contribute a lot. Thanks. There are two questions here, Ali, and then Sullivan. Um, my name is Ali Tripp. I'm a fellow here at the Wilson Center and a professor of political science at University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, I make a comment and then a question. Um, I have a graduate student who is working in Somaliland doing research there on, on remittances from the U.S. And uh, she made an observation which, which fits with one thing that you said, that she was looking at the marketplaces and people would leave their, their money and their goods overnight with no police, with no security, and they were there the next morning. And she was very <laughs> surprised because there's really no place in the world you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so it was anyway. Um, but my question has to do with the, with the where the democratic aspirations are at. Um, my understanding <coughs> is that the Constitution allows for three parties, but I understand that it's a, that somehow it's ended up being specific three parties and that um, other parties are not able to, to for example, a Karan party has been um, under some pressure and um, some of its leaders were arrested. And I'm wondering how, um, how does that um, fit with the democratic aspirations of, um, of the country? Uh, I think the man who is talking for this Karan, mm -hmm. Karan is not an accepted uh, party mm -hmm. legally within our constitution. Mm -hmm. He's one of the men who formulated this constitution, that the parties will not exceed more than three parties. <coughs> and now <laughs> he, he, he worked against the, uh, the laws that he was put there. As a president, I am the guide of the Constitution. Uh, 
yeah, yeah. I'm guarding the Constitution. I look after the Constitution. If there is a change in the amendment in the parliament, I'm not against that. But we cannot accept a person who didn't have the legality to go and run for election. You can join the other. You used to have an, an organization previously. But in our constitution, there were six uh, organizations who ran for our local elections. And it was in the understanding that the three top who will gain the top Votes will only be qualified for national party, as our constitution tells. His organization joined to my, some of them joined to my party, and the others joined to that party. He didn't have any, he's not, he's not, he's trying to go out of the constitution. That's why we are, but if we make amendment in our constitution, mm -hmm. then they can run. But, uh, Somebody who wants to, to make his own without passing through the constitutional procedures cannot get a party. This is uh, uh, very, very clear. The, uh, when we were moving from uh, national, national charter based to, to, to constitutional state, uh, according to the constitution, <coughs> a would be political organization have to have to be, have, there, there were certain criteria. A, a non-sectarian, non-religious, non-sectarian and non-tribal uh, and non-religious, uh, uh, regional. Now, the political organizations, the number was not limited. In fact, there were initially about nine. One of the first political organizations that was formed was called the Islamic Organization of Somaliland. There, it was immediately disqualified by the Commission of National Commission, uh, National Registration Commission. In the final analysis, there were six political organizations that qualified to run for local elections. In order to qualify for local government elections, in fact, they have to, you know, uh, conform to these criteria. In order to qualify a national political party, which was limited only to three. But any three or specific? Circumstances? No, no, any three. I mean, so there, was also, there was also, also a criteria for them. In order to become a national political party, that political party has to qualify all the above, I told you. Plus, it has to get at least 20 percent of the vote. Of vote, 20 percent of the votes, at least four out of the six regions. And that is how that three current political parties, national political parties, were selected. But then why were they, the leaders arrested? That's the no, part. Let me, yeah. Just let me explain. Sorry. Now, that was it. The, pro, the pro, other political organizations failed. Those who failed either joined it, for, for example, a classical case. The, uh, one of the major political organizations that did not qualify, the chairman of that political organization and some of his uh, uh, people join it, the, for example, other party. Uh, his uh, second man moved into one of the other political parties. So immediately the National Commission was disbanded according to, according to the Constitution. So the Karan, which was a new phenomenon just recently, formed a political organization political organization. Political organizations have, do not have a platform. In order a political organization to run for local government elections, it has to go through the process. In other words, the constitution has to be amended. Now, in fact, there was a trial that was made uh, immediately after the elections. There was a motion that was passed in the House of Representatives, which said that political future political organizations ought to be allow it to run in every five years. Parliament passed it, and it went to the House of Elders for, you know, the, the two ha have to pass. The House of Elders rejected that motion by two-thirds. So that was the end of the game. Now, the government position is, in fact, the government position was 
that political parties, before, they were, before we even agreed, we wanted to have more than three political parties. It was parliament who rejected it in those days. But today, we have a constitution that limits and a national uh, commission on registration that has been, you know, that has finished its job. How can we do that? That is, a, one has to go through the constitution. We are willing to go through that. But we have to go through the system, either a national referendum or through the parliament, through the legal system, in order to obtain, you know, the green light for establishing future political organizations to run, you know. So this is, this is, this is the situation. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Why he was arrested? The reason that they were arrested is that they formed a political organization. It, they, they were advised to go through the system, to the courts, whether this is allowable or not allowable. They refused. They opened physical offices. Not only that, they then <coughs> campaigned for rally, rallies, memberships. Can you imagine the problem that the country has faced? And that was in every major city or town that they went and formed political organizations, like, like Karan, there were two different views within the community. Those who were saying they have the right, according to the Constitution, they can form a political organization and they can open offices. And there are those who were saying, no, this is illegal. And in fact, instead of taking to their case to the court and to the system, they put it into the public. And that was really a kangaroo court. In other words, in fact, security became at stake. That's the only time then the Attorney General uh, The attorney, that's the time the Attorney General uh, brought a case against them. Professor, uh, I can, uh, profe here. Yeah, good. Professor, I can just say that, to, to that just quickly, that uh, I think this is a matter of uh, views at this point, at the end of the day, uh, of interpreting the Constitution. And I think really the issue has become a constitutional one that needs a, you know, an answer from a constitutional court. So the two sides who see the issue differently, at least, would know exactly where is the you know, constitution stands. We need that for future development too and for future political participation. It is a question to be answered. Yeah. So two more questions here in the comment and then David. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Peter Fahm from James Madison University. Um, uh, Mr. President, um, I'd like to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, and perhaps with the <coughs> Minister of Foreign Affairs, to outline for us what you view as the roadmap ahead. We've been uh, at this for 15 years or more, the question of recognition, and the progress has been made with small steps at the African Union level and on the international level. Mm -hmm. It's marginal still. How do you see the, you know, the future, the roadmap in the next after the elections in the next year or two, maybe five-year period, to move this issue forward other than seeking the recognition which, you know, many of us hope will come, but, you know, we can't bank everything on that one issue. Uh, I think the roadmap for our recognition, you, you yes, ask how, how do you see proceeding forward? Before? I think we, we must, uh, and it's, what we, are, what we are facing is level standard from the international community. You know, many countries in Europe have been recognized, which, and there were no problems that they faced. What we are pushing is to advocate for our case, legal case, in the African Union, the United Nations, and to confess international, any country in Europe, in America, we are working for that. But we will continue our case to go for, for how, no matter how, long. how long it will take, we'll continue our case to confess any member state all over the world, 
US, UK, European countries, not Africa only. But many Europeans and your country, they were telling us that we must go to the African Union. I was telling you that it's a long, impossible mission to, co to get 80, 28 member states of Africa to confess our case. It's uh, difficult. Our is difficult. But we would like the international community to revisit our case <coughs> in the Security Council. Uh, the Security Council, every com everything comes from the Security Council. It was a resolution that was passed way back in 93 by the Security Council that the unity is sacred. This is the problem that we are facing. We are trying to confess which way or the other, with the help of our friends in worldwide, how this can be revisited and the it. problem of Somaliland and Somalia be dealt differently. Because we have been given as a gift to our brothers, Somalia. And we, we've never been a property of Somalia. We, we were two countries that came together. And in, in many African countries, Ghana, no, uh, Senegambia. Senegambia, they joined it and they separated. Uh, Mali and Senegal, Rwanda, uh, Burundi, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, they united and they separated. Uh, they have never met what we have met from the international community. Talk, and even what we are facing the challenge that we are facing in our recognition is more difficult than anyone. Other countries who are running for recognition, they are running from a functioning states. Like Kosovo, they are running from Serbia. But Somaliland, we become a victim of, for a valid state, which is not functioning. That's another problem that we are facing as Somalilanders. So we appeal to you, to the intellectuals in everywhere, to advocate for our case in the future. That we are has to be, to be re revisited, our case to be revisited, and because legally we have fulfilled all conditions of statehood. There is no legal problem that we are facing, but it is only a political problem that we are facing. So we we'll, would we'll like this there must be a resolution. That, the easiest way, I can say, there must be a new resolution that's coming from the Security Council, some way or the other. Because Africa, it will take a long way to get out our recognition. But we, will, we have no other choice. If we didn't get from other places, we'll continue to push the African member states also. We, we are not only preoccupied uh, with uh, at the end of the day on recognition. We are doing what we have been doing right from the beginning, since 91. Institutional building, beefing up these institutions. It's a nation building process. Uh, several tracks, development, governance, promoting, of course, uh, the case of Somaliland all along. These are all several parallel tracks, and that's exactly what we are doing. Development is is, is, is another, an, another, another, another major, uh, ma major issue. And always pushing, of course, the case of Somaliland. So we have been doing, of course, incrementally. We have already made big gains, as we, we consider. We came, in fact, from a long way. The fact that the African Union is talking about the case of Somaliland itself is very, very significant. The fact that we are sitting here together is very, very sig significant. The fact that we have been uh, received very well by the U.S. State Department and others is very, very significant. The fact that we are traveling with our own passports is also very, very significant. So we are de facto. So the fact of the matter is that we are not only saying we are waiting just for recognition. There will be a f over four million U.S. dollar investment very soon by a German European consortium on the cement factory. Four hundred. Over. Of, of a 400 million, 400 in fact, to be exact, 411 million U.S. dollars. And that will be very, very soon. Uh, we are doing our seismic survey for, for, for our oil and, our oil and uh, gas and mineral resources, including water. 
you know, it's still going on. And we're talking about uh, maybe March, uh, April, March, May, they will come up with the data. So we are building the nation, the, uh, the institutions of health, education, and so on, social services, and the most importantly, the democratization process. This is absolutely one of the top priorities, and this is the roadmap that will lead to us where we want to, 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 to reach, to recognition. If, if uh, Colin and then David. Uh, my name is Colin Thomas Jensen. I'm a policy advisor with an organization called the Enough Project. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, I mean, it seems when you really boil down what U.S. policymakers are asking themselves on whether or not to recognize Somaliland, it's a very simple question, and that is, does recognition further U.S. counterterrorism objectives in the region? Does it undermine them, or, or does it really not matter very much? And to me, you've got to make the case that they further them, because if it's, if it's a push, well, then what's the advantage to the U.S.? It's a pragmatic issue. So what's the argument?